Good morning, and welcome to University Baptist Church on this fifth Sunday of Lent, March 21st, 2021. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is David Tomasachi, and I'm the Director of Music here at University Baptist Church. At any time, you can pause and check out this video's description to see listed there today's worship order, leaders, and musicians. I'll also take this moment to invite each of you to sing along during the Approaching God hymn, the doxology, and our postlude for the season of Lent, Shalom Havarim. I'd like to thank Reverend Carrie Cheeseman for delivering the sermon and benediction this morning. Our message in music for today is the song, The Summons, by John L. Bell. Our archival recording of this piece comes from October 21st of 2018 and features the UBC Choir, Molly Rausch on piano, and Justin Swain, Sandy Charisse, and Tim Spangler as soloists. The words of this anthem, written by Bell and Graham Mall, are as follows. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoner free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen, and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me? Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. I'd like to take a moment and thank those who contributed to UBC's online Lenten devotional series this past week. My thanks to Sandy Charisse for her video devotional, on confidence, to Pat Rohrbaugh for her interviews about and resulting devotional on baptism, to Pastor Carol Cotts, who has shared so many wonderful and heartfelt devotionals with us this Lent, and to Joseph Grove for his devotional on Peter's Leap of Faith. If you haven't done so yet, please remember to take a moment and check our Facebook page for today's video devotional psalm reading by Pat Rohrbaugh. And now, I invite you all to rise in your spirits, to come and follow him who stands among us in his risen power, and to join us in our worship this morning. Shalom, peace be with you, and welcome to University Baptist Church. Hello, I'm Ken Watkins. I'm the Associate Pastor of University Baptist Church, Columbus, Ohio. I add my greetings to the greetings of others who are making this video this worship video. Uh, today, as we attempted to move, uh, drive our our red Subaru, which has been uh, sitting idle for a month or so, uh, we uh, discovered that we that our battery was dead, uh, and uh, so I, I backed the the our other Subaru, Subaru up beside it, ran cables over, and uh, and and started it right up. Um, I was thinking that how 
that is a bit like uh, some of us have been maybe during this COVID time. We've been sitting still. We've been uh, not doing. Uh, we've been doing. And there are parts of us that have become rusty, or there are parts of us that who's that just have been like batteries that just sort of run down. Um, and uh, my hope for this worship service today, and um, and any time that we gather virtually or literally, uh, uh, personally, I I hope that uh, it's a time for recharging. Uh, if my battery's low and I am with people, with someone else whose battery is 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 charged, uh, I can get a charge from them. Um, actually, that's the way we get charged for spiritual charging. Our spiritual, um, that's how the way that we get our spirit recharged. Uh, that's the way we encounter Christ and is, uh, is through those around us. And there are other ways in the, in the silence of the day or in the in the, um, the beauty of the of nature but church is church is more of a sure thing it's the coming together of people to recharge each other or as the book of hebrews says to stir each other up for for good deeds may our service today do that for us may god bless us as we as we as we worship amen let us join together in our opening prayer. God of wilderness and water, your son was baptized and tempted as we are. Guide us through this season that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to blessing through the cleansing depth of repentance and the heaven-rending words of your spirit. Amen. Let us share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, UBC. I'm Renee Arabola, and I'm here with uh, one of two scripture readings for today. This passage comes from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Good morning, UBC. Mike Arvola here with the reading uh, from the New Testament of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Today I'll be using the message uh, translation. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the fest at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Holy Parent will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now, I am storm-tossed. What am I going to say? O oh, Holy One, get me out of this? No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Abba, put your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The listening crowd said, Thunder. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus said, The voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of the world, will be thrown out. And I, 
as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. gospel reading for this morning you heard just a few minutes ago, but I'd like to reread a small portion of it as we begin our message today. From John chapter 12. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip together went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You know, no one really likes to talk about death. 
Even pastors tend to avoid the subject as much as is humanly possible. But for the past year, we have all dealt with significant matters of life and death. Yes, I'm speaking about the pandemic. More than 540,000 lives have been lost in this country alone, and more than 2.7 million lives around the world. No community has been immune from the virus or its pathway of death. During our passage through Lent, we have been preparing ourselves for the eventual death and resurrection of Jesus, even if we haven't talked about it too much. We don't like to talk about it. Death stings. Death hurts. Death makes us cry out in anguish. And here, in this lesson from John chapter 12, we hear Jesus talk not only about his own death, but also, metaphorically, about ours. So let's see how we got here. Where in Jesus' story does this fit? If we go back to John chapter 11, we see a movement, the Jesus movement, a movement that is gaining traction and, and spreading almost like a wildfire. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. And when he was raised from the dead, many people believed. Many people believed in Jesus. And following Lazarus' resurrection from the dead, Jesus had a meal with Lazarus and Mary and Martha, as well as with Judas and some of the other disciples. And it is at this meal that Mary anoints Jesus' feet with expensive perfume, sparking a discussion that probably confused those who heard it. Anyway, word spread around Jesus that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And people started showing up in droves. Who wouldn't want to go see this miracle worker and the one who had been brought back from the dead? I can imagine scores of them wanting to take selfies with Jesus and with Lazarus, if cameras had been invented back then. They were standing in line to shake his hand. They were standing in line to sit at his feet and learn. The popularity of Jesus and the increasingly large crowds who believed in him, mostly because of the raising of Lazarus, it was a real concern for the chief priests. They actually began to plot his death and the death of Lazarus as well. But in spite of that, kind of like a big swarm of locusts that couldn't be stopped, the people just kept coming. The mighty crowd that came to the yearly festival in Jerusalem heard that Jesus was going to be there. Well, you know the story. They took branches from the palm trees and they met Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. They called out to him saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! And many cried out to him as their king. From the moment Jesus raised Lazarus, until the moment that he went into Jerusalem riding on a young colt. The crowd of people who believed in him continued to grow. That crowd had seen that even death couldn't stop Jesus. It was no match for him. And they were moved to belief. They saw many other amazing things as well in his ministry. And they believed. The Pharisees, on the other hand, well, they were deeply concerned about this growing movement. And John tells us that they said to each other, look, the world has gone after him. And that's where our passage today begins. We hear these words. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And they came to see Jesus. They find Philip, 
a disciple of Jesus's with a Greek name, and they make this wonderful inquiry. Sir, we want to see Jesus. There's actually a whole sermon in that one sentence, but that's not for today. Indeed, the world had gone after him. The news of Jesus was never intended for one group of people or for one time period or for one geographical location. No, it is for the world, for the Jews, for the Greeks, for everyone. Now, I can imagine Philip and Andrew being extremely excited at this point. The Jesus movement is growing and reaching out, and even the Gentiles are starting to come in. Everything was on an upward path, a new excitement growing daily. It seemed like everyone wanted to get in on the ground floor of this amazing thing that Jesus had. So Philip and Andrew ran off to tell Jesus. And they likely expected him to say something like, show them in. Don't make them wait. I want to talk to them. But their excitement quickly turned cold. When Jesus responded, not by talking about the movement, not by talking about reaching out to Gentiles, but with a lesson about death? Oh, come on, Jesus. Really? All this excitement and you want to talk about death? What a downer. So what was Jesus' wisdom that day? Like so many times during his ministry, he began with an agricultural reference. Something that his disciples and, and most others in the crowd that day would have understood. Even if us city folks have a hard time figuring it out today. He begins with this statement. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Hmm. He just raised Lazarus from the death, and here we go with the death stories again. But this one may be a little bit easier for most of us to digest, especially if we turn from grains of wheat to something a little bit more common and easier for us city dwellers in Ohio to understand. This week, most of you are likely looking outside, maybe outside your own home or apartment complex or perhaps the campus buildings, and you see marvelous signs of life springing forth from the ground. Yesterday was the first day of spring, and just in the past 10 days or so, the daffodils have started to push up high from the muddy ground. Other bulb plants are close behind. I suspect that I'm looking at more of them than most of you are, because Marianne had this idea to plant more than 200 daffodils and a couple of dozen hyacinths last fall. And yes, they're all coming up right now. Some of you may think that that's a little excessive, but our neighbors will get a wonderful show of color by the time Easter comes around. Anyway, flower bulbs, daffodils, hyacinths, all of those, well, they're basically dead. They're stored for a year or two in bags and then sold ready to plant. There are really no signs of life. They're dry. They're shriveled up. They lack moisture. There's no green, no stem, no, well, nothing that would indicate that there's any life in them. But once they're in the soil, it's only a matter of time. The right soil temperature, water, sunshine, and life springs forth from their lifeless shells. First they die, then they put forth much fruit and much beauty. Jesus continues his lesson this day by saying, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. 
and where I am, there will my servant be also. Jesus is telling us that we, like the daffodil bulb, must lose our present life to gain it again with Jesus. When the flower bulb is, is dried so that it can be prepared to bring forth new life, it loses water and vital nutrients. And this takes time. We too must give up some of our basic substance, some of our daily routine, to gain the opportunity to truly follow Jesus. And this too takes time. It's something that we all struggle with and something that requires time and effort. We don't just follow Jesus because we want to. We have to work at it. And we have to put effort into producing the fruit for the kingdom. Many of those in the crowds that came to the festival wanted to see Jesus. But I suspect only a few of them would be willing to do what it really takes to become one of his followers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul picks up on this image of a grain of wheat, the image used by Jesus in our text today, or the image of the flower bulb that we have used today. Here, he applies it to all Christians, to all believers. Here, he speaks of Christ's resurrection as the first fruits and the resurrection of Christ's people being the harvest that is to follow. Then he speaks to those who are denying a future resurrection of believers when he says this, Oh, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Paul picks up this image that Jesus uses, that of a grain of wheat that must die to bear abundant fruit. And he points out how Christ has not only done this himself, but he has forged a path for his people to follow. He has forged a path for all who trust him, for us, today. So what about those of us who have already taken that path and asked Jesus into our lives? Have we, like the daffodils and the hyacinths, borne our fruits and are finished with death? Hardly. Since most of us in Ohio are not very familiar with wheat, let me use corn as a further example here. Think of those wonderful ears of corn that you will have this summer and all of those barbecues that you missed last summer. Marianne and I have good friends that grow thousands of acres of corn in Iowa. Ed relates the growing process this way. The seed what you and I see as kernels of corn, are dried on the cob, then stripped off and placed in a seed bag to continue the drying process. The seed continues to dry and, and is stored for the next season. After planting at the right time, plants emerge and eventually produce seed cobs of their own. But that would be the end of the farm and the end of the story if the cycle weren't repeated every year. The new kernels are likewise dried on the cob, removed, stored, and planted as the previous generation of seed had been. Every year, the process of death and resurrection has to be repeated if life is to continue. For us as Christians, the 
same process of regular, ongoing renewal is absolutely vital. Death and resurrection are not a one-time process, but rather an ongoing challenge that opens us up to new life in Christ at every opportunity. Without regular renewal in Christ, we will surely die. We won't bring forth new life for the kingdom of God. And for us as a church, the same is true. Whether we are talking about UBC or the wider Christian community, periodically, we must let loose of old traditions, let them die, in order to be reborn with excitement for the next generation. Our Lenten journey to Holy Week and the resurrection events of Easter morning forces us to think about death. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Jesus' lesson challenges us today and tomorrow and every day that death is a necessary part of a vibrant life for us individually and for us as the church. Are we willing to give up a part of ourselves to gain a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we willing to do it over and over and over again that we might be renewed in that relationship on a regular basis? And if the answer is yes, what parts are we willing to let die that new life may spring forth in us? The answer to these questions is quite individual. There is no magic answer for us. There was no magic answer for the Greeks that came to see Jesus. Like them, I hope each of us can honestly say, I want to see Jesus and do what it takes to make that happen. Here again, the words from the Gospel of John. And Jesus said to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. May God help us to serve the risen Christ and follow wherever he may lead us. Amen. Good, gracious, and loving God, 
We are scattered throughout this city, worshiping this morning from our own homes as we have grown accustomed to recently. Lord, there are many of us who long to return to the sanctuary, see the beautiful space, see our brothers and sisters in Christ face to face. It has been over a year now since our last worship service at BC, and we are eager to regain that sense of normalcy once again. While it may seem impossible at times, time and time again, Lord, you have delivered your people, and you will deliver them once more. But until that time comes, Lord, send your spirit into our homes and fill our hearts with a sense of connection and oneness as we worship virtually. Lord, during the week, we have had praises and joys that we thank you for, but we've also had hardships and sadness that we ask for your comfort and guidance. As we take a brief moment of silence, listen to the prayers of your people, Lord. For all of these prayers and those we hold in the silence of our hearts, we ask, loving God, hear our prayer. For it is in your son's most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. This is the offertory portion of the service. This is the time when we reflect on God's goodness to us, the gifts that God has given us, uh, the ways that God has touched our lives. Uh, and it's also a time to listen as God uh, calls us to, to give to others, uh, to give of ourselves, to give of our financial resources, um, to give of our influence, uh, to give words of encouragement, and, it, and in, during this time, my, my prayer is that all of us will, will, will hear God uh, leading us toward others. Um, if you would like to give to University Baptist Church, uh, and your gifts are very important to sustaining uh, the just the basics, uh, keeping maintaining a building and, and, having, and keeping uh, staff and to reaching out into the world. If you're interested in giving or feel called and a nudge from God to give to University Baptist Church, you can send a check to 50 West Lane Avenue, 43201, um, UBC, 50 West Lane Avenue, 43201. Or you can go online to ubccolumbus.org, uh, and uh, on the first page, you can scroll down to the donation, where it says donation. And then there's a menu that pops up down, pop up, pop down menu, and you can you can indicate that, that, that you want your gift to go to support the, the budget of the University of Baptist Church. Uh, this is the time of year. It's also when American Baptist uh, are, is collects uh, funds to to support its home mission its home mission work, and U3C every year participates in this giving. Um, you can. Uh, you can you can give online to this, just as I had described that you could give for the, uh, the church, or you can give for this special mission uh, mission program. So you go to ubc ubccolumbus.org, uh, scroll down, and then there's a and then when you when you look at the menu of options to give near the very bottom, there's America for Christ. Click on that, and it tell and you can you can. Um, give your you can give your your donation through that, or write a check. Just be sure on the check to indicate that you want your want it to go for America for Christ. Uh, you probably have received a letter, or if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you might look in your COVID style stack of letters, or maybe it will arrive soon. Um, a letter from UBC telling you more about this special offer. So let us pray as we as we reflect on God's goodness to us and his calling to, to us to, to give. Oh God, your love for us is boundless. Uh, you walk with us in, in, the, in times of loneliness and you touch us through the lives of others. Help each of us to be uh, an agent of your touch in the world in which we live. We ask your blessing on gifts that have been offered during this time. 
be gifts that have not been actualized, that have not been used, that have not been sent. Help us to follow through with our, with your call, following your call to give. And bless that which we give for the sake of the kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. this time of worship today, know that the cross of Good Friday and the resurrection of Easter morning are right around the corner. Death and resurrection are not things to shun, but rather things to rejoice in if they are linked to our Lord Jesus Christ. So go forth, saying as the Greeks did that day at the festival, I want to see Jesus and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Amen. Shalom, hallelujah, shalom, hallelujah, shalom.